on this Easter morning, Paul Benavides walked in my office and says, what are you preaching on today? I said, I'll give you three guesses. It's the resurrection. <laughs> so let's uh, open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and uh, also take out your notes as we talk about embracing the truth of the resurrection. Embracing the truth of the resurrection. <clears throat> I can't think of a greater chapter to look at today as Paul exposits through this chapter uh, those things, what would it be like without the resurrection and with it. And we're going to focus on that this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, Paul said, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, to Peter, then to the twelve. And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then all, to all the apostles." May God add his blessing at the reading of his word this morning. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we open your word today. We ask your Holy Spirit would illumine our minds so we can understand it, that we could receive it, that we could apply it to our hearts and lives. We thank you, Lord, for this being the greatest day in all of history, that we can gather and celebrate the risen Savior. And uh, Lord, we just pray that as we go through this passage, we'll be encouraged We'll have some um, facts and things we can share with others about the truth of the resurrection, and then we can just have that calm assurance and that hope that we have eternal life with you and abundant life here on earth. We pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, there was a woman in England, her name was Margaret Sangster Fippen, and in the mid-50s, her father was still alive, and he was a pastor, W.A. Sangster. And so as uh, he was pastoring, one day he woke up and he began to have a soreness in his throat, and he noticed that he was dragging his leg, and uh, he went to the doctor and he found out that he had an incurable uh, disease that was going to cause his muscles to atrophy, to eventually, you know, they would, he would lose all use of his legs. Pretty soon his throat, he wouldn't be able to speak and he wouldn't be able to swallow. And so he said to the Lord, Lord... You've given me this church to be the general of. Now move me and help me to become a person who works with a smaller group of people, a regiment of people. And so he resigned his church and he began to write articles. He wrote books. He began to set up prayer enclaves throughout England as he began to lose the use of his muscles. <clears throat> Finally, one day he woke up and he couldn't speak anymore. His legs no longer would allow him to stand and he knew he was coming to the end of his life. And he woke up a few days before Easter. And I thought it was interesting what he said, because he couldn't speak anymore. He was struggling. He said, he said, I don't mind if I can no longer be a general, he said, but it's a terrible thing to wake up on Easter morning and have no voice to shout, he is risen. But it would be still more terrible to have a voice and not want to shout. Isn't it amazing that God has revealed to us as Christ followers that the day we came to Christ, we realized we serve a living and resurrected Lord who's right now seated at the right hand of the throne of God, praying for us and praying on our behalf before God the Father. We believe that Jesus Christ physically rose from the dead early Sunday morning. We believe he was dead when he was placed in the tomb on Friday afternoon. We don't ascribe to the swoon theory. The beatings, the crucifixion, and the confirmation he was dead was shown to us by the Roman centurion taking a spear and putting it into his side and blood and water coming out. But for a moment, let's look at what Paul says to us in that great resurrection chapter of the Bible in 1 Corinthians 15 as he answers the question, what if the resurrection is false? What if the resurrection is false? Here are eight reasons that Christianity would be a waste of time and we would be fools to believe it if the bodily resurrection of Christ were not true. 
First of all, the gospel would not be preached. The gospel would not be preached. Look again at verses 1 through 4. Paul said, now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received. So they believed on the gospel in which you stand. They were living their lives based on the gospel and by which you are being saved. You know, when we pray to receive Christ, that's just the beginning. And our salvation continues until our faith becomes sight and we are made into the image of Christ. He says, in which you're being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as a first importance. He's saying this is the most important thing that I could share with anyone. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, there'd be no message of reconciliation to be passed on. We would have no way to have access directly to a holy God. There would be no message of hope in this life. Jesus is the only certain hope that people can bank on in this life. Hal Lindsey in his book, The Late Great Planet Earth, said, man can live with the, about 40 days without food, about three days without water, about eight minutes without air, but only for one second without hope, without hope. So what is the gospel as Paul presents it here in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4? Well, it was the earliest creed of the church. A creed is a saying that they would repeat when they gathered together for worship. And this is the earliest one. And according to my professor I had in school for my graduate degree, master's degree in apologetics, Gary Habermas said, you can look back through history And maybe even within hours of Jesus' resurrection, they were repeating this phrase of the gospel. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. Jesus rose from the dead physically. In Romans 1, it says, Concerning his son, who has descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power, According to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans 4.25 says, Who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised up for our justification. Jesus rose from the dead so that we could be justified in our hearts with a holy God. That we'd have access. And justification means that he looks at us just as if we never sinned. Can you imagine that? When we come to the cross and we receive the gospel, he forgives us and cleanses us from all our unrighteousness and he sees us just as if we never sinned. If Jesus hadn't been raised, Christ would still be in the grave. It says in verses 12 and 13 of 1 Corinthians 15, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is, that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Many liberal theologians believe Jesus' resurrection is just figurative. Some believe he only rose again in spirit, but not physically. They believe his body is still buried somewhere. But there's many problems with that. We know in 1 Corinthians 15, it says he was seen by the disciples. He was seen by up to 500 people at one time. And some of these folks were hostile to Jesus, and yet he appeared to them. Lee Strobel, in his book, The Case for Christ, it talks about how he went and talked to a psychologist about, is it possible for 500 people to have the same hallucinate dream at the same time? He said, absolutely impossible. And then no one could refute the tomb was empty. In fact, we see the Sanhedrin, Caiaphas and the religious leaders, they had to pay off the Roman soldiers and some of the Roman leaders to say that the disciples came and stole the body. They did not believe that it was empty. They did. They concocted a, a scheme to be able to explain it away so that they could say Jesus didn't physically rise from the dead. Our preaching would be in vain. In verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised... 
then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. There would be no need for church. There would be no need for the Bible. No need to pray, to have faith in God. We would be wasting our time. It would be better to follow the ways of this world system and the philosophies of this culture. And we see many people do all kinds of things to escape reality and try to uh, figure out how to deal with the guilt of the sin in their lives through addictions and many other ways. And that would be the way of our lives. We would have no hope. Also, if Jesus didn't come out of the grave, it would make God and the apostles liars. <clears throat> it would make the God and the apostles liars. Look at verse 15 of 1 Corinthians 15. We're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true, that the dead are not raised. All that God and Jesus had done would be proven false. Who would believe the teachings of Jesus after his death if he wasn't resurrected like he promised? Why would the apostles be willing to die for a lie? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, there would be no hope after death. Be no hope. Verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. No hope of heaven. No hope of seeing our loved ones and friends who've gone on before us. Life would end like an animal in death. It would be kind of like a battery just going out and you would no longer exist. If Christ didn't come out of the grave, we would still be lost in our sin. We'd be lost in our sin. In verse 17, and if Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. We would not have a way to have access to a holy God. We would be separated from him because of our sin. And there would be no way to bridge that gap. You could see the hopelessness and the despair in some people's eyes. And those who are Christ followers would be just like them. If the resurrection wasn't a proven fact that it's true. In a few moments, we're going to talk about the evidence that is outside the Bible and history and other places to show the truth of this world changing event. All dead believers in Christ would be in hell or we would no longer exist. It says in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 15, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Have perished. This would be the absolute worst reality of all time to either not exist or to be in hell for eternity. If Christ had not risen from the dead, we would be miserable and considered fools in verse 19 of that chapter. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. There'd be no purpose in life. We could just live by our feelings and whatever we wanted to do. We wouldn't have a moral compass. We wouldn't have a conscience to, to deal with. We would not have the Holy Spirit or the Bible to give us direction in life. We would not have a community of fellow believers to share life with and to worship with. We would be lonely and left to our own means to figure out this riddle of life. We would lose all we have when we consider the Christian life. There would be absolutely no reason to be a Christian or to live the Christian life. So the application here is if the resurrection didn't occur, if Jesus didn't physically come out of the grave, we could say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, would be the motto of our lives. That could be the motto of our lives. We live, we enjoy the pleasures of this world as much as we could get, and then we're turned off, we die, and that's it. And thank God we have the assurance that the resurrection is true. And as one person said, that Christianity is like a house of cards. It is completely and utterly supported by the fact of the historical proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And one of the unique things about Christianity is it can be proven historically. Not many religions of the world can claim that to be true. Well, a few days before Easter, there was a biology teacher in a high school class and he says, there is no such thing as the resurrection of Christ. There is no God. 
And uh, little Jimmy, it was in the class, and he raised his hand. He says, I believe there's a God, and I believe Jesus rose from the dead. He says, really? He says, well, the teacher went on to say, well, we believe in naturalism. There are no miracles. There's no such thing as the afterlife. You can believe all you want, but there's no evidence for that. And Jimmy said, well, God isn't limited by science. In fact, he created science. And so you've probably heard this story before. The science teacher went over and opened up a refrigerator and brought out an egg. And he stood before the class and he said, Jimmy, in a moment I'm going to drop this egg and you can pray and ask God that it won't break into pieces. But gravity is going to pull it to the ground and it's going to burst on the floor. And so everyone was looking at the teacher. Everyone was looking at Jimmy. And Jimmy stood up and he prayed this little prayer. He said, he said, Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that when my teacher drops the egg, it will break in 100 pieces. And I also pray, Lord, that when the egg does break, my teacher will have a heart attack and die. <laughs> Amen. Well, there was a collective gasp in the room. Like, what is going to happen now? And they looked at that teacher. And that teacher looked at Jimmy, looked at the egg, walked over to the refrigerator, put the egg back in the refrigerator. <laughs> and he said, class dismissed. The teacher apparently believed in God more than he thought he did. And many people, like the teacher, deny that God exists, yet they run from him, question him, and attack him whenever they get the chance. Jimmy knew God wouldn't strike his teacher dead, but he also knew the teacher wouldn't take the chance, wouldn't take the risk. He wouldn't depend, put his life on it. So what if the resurrection is true? And it is true, as we think about that. First of all, we would celebrate a risen Savior. We would celebrate a risen Savior. In verse 20 of this chapter, Paul said, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. And I like verse 22. For as in all Adam, for as in all Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Sin entered this world when Adam and Eve were in the garden. And God said to them, they can, you can eat anything in this garden except for this one tree. And of course, wouldn't you know it, they gravitated to that tree. Eve ate first, gave it to Adam, and they committed sin. <clears throat> God comes along and he says, Adam, where are you? God had always met with Adam and Eve, but now Adam was hiding because he was in sin, separated from God. And so he was the one who brought sin into the world. Jesus was willing to die on the cross to give us the hope of eternal life. And I want to remind you that there's all kinds of different world religions that Buddha died at 80 years of age while living in India, and you can go and visit his grave. On June 8th, 862 AD in Medina, Turkey, Muhammad died, and you can go visit his grave. Confucius died around 500 BC, and they have a marker commemorating where his grave site is. But Christ's tomb is empty, and if you read 1 Corinthians 15, we see the many evidences of his resurrection. Look at verse 5. And then he appeared to Cephas, to Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. You see, because Christ rose again, we have an abundant and purpose-filled life. We have an abundant and purpose-filled life now here on earth that will be consummated into perfection when we get to heaven. Paul concludes his defense of the resurrection of Christ with this verse as he ends chapter 15. With verse 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Because of the resurrection, salvation can begin today for anyone who places their faith and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Because Christ rose again, we have forgiveness of sin and the removal of guilt and shame. As I mentioned Friday night, the Good Friday service, one of the markers of 
Christianity that's different from other religions is that he removes our shame as well as the guilt. We are new creations in Christ. The old things are passing away and we're putting on the new man. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, and I love that word all, all unrighteousness. We can rest fully on the word of God. We can rest fully on the word of God because Jesus rose from the dead. It says in 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Because Jesus was the Logos, the Word, and he revealed the truths of Scripture, and it was verified by his resurrection that his words and what he said were true, and the Word of God that we have gives us power to transform us. Because of the resurrection of Christ, we know who the true God is. As Jesus interacted with God before he was crucified, before he was buried, before he rose again. After he rose again, it gave evidence that the one true God was the one that he was in relationship with, that he had been telling the world about, Yahweh, Jehovah. So we know who the true God is. In John 14, 9, whoever has seen me, Jesus said, has seen the Father. The fallacy of our times is that many people believe there are many ways to God. Or that other religions are just another road to God and that God has many different names. But if you were out swimming, like I would love to go to the Outer Banks, and they have riptides often, and you can't swim out too far. And what if you get caught in a riptide and you can't get back? And they send out a lifeguard in a boat, and they want to throw you a life preserver, and you say, you know, I want a blue one. No, I'd rather have a red one. No, I'd rather have a green one. No, you're going to take that preserver, whatever it is, and you're going to hold it, and you're going to cling to it with your life as they pull you into that boat. Jesus' resurrection points us to the only way to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ himself. The resurrection, we can enjoy all the benefits of the power of the resurrection. It tells us in Colossians 2.12, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless above reproach before him. It tells us in Romans that the same power that brought Jesus out of the grave is living in us if we're a believer in Christ, the Holy Spirit. And that's what transforms us. That's what changes the habits of sin in our life and breaks the addictions in our lives. It's the resurrection power the same power that Jesus, that God used to bring Jesus out of the grave. So we enjoy all the benefits of the power of the resurrection. We have purpose and meaning in life. We have an abundant life that's filled with joy. We have hope no matter what we face. Knowing that God is with us at all times. In Proverbs, it describes him as a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He never leaves us. We have the Holy Spirit living within us and we have the hope of eternal life. And because Jesus rose again, we have the evidence to show that the resurrection is true. Many say, well, just because the Bible says that Jesus rose from the dead, that isn't enough to prove it's true. This is what people who are biased say about the resurrection. Well, how about some external evidence outside the Bible? First of all, historical evidence. Historical evidence. Do you realize that a number of years ago, they got together a group of historians and none of them were believers in Christ and they did the research and they came up with these 10 things that they agreed upon. First of all, the death of Jesus via crucifixion. He was crucified. That Jesus was buried. That the disciples were in despair. The empty tomb with grave clothes. They said that was true. Number five, the disciples' experience of seeing the resurrected Jesus. Number six, the transformation of the disciples from fear to boldness and willingness to die for their beliefs. The disciples preaching in Jerusalem is a historical fact outside the Bible. 
the birth of the church in Jerusalem, the practice of worship on Sunday, and one that's really hard to refute is the Apostle Paul's conversion and believed to have seen the resurrected Christ. Historians, unbelievers, all say these are historical, undisputed facts. Empirical evidence. What's empirical? That means someone who was alive during that time, who talked to people who were eyewitnesses at that time. They could speak and touch and have relationship with these people, and Josephus was just one of those people. Josephus was an unbelieving Jew. He was a historian. He was well thought of in that time. And toward the end of the first century, 50, 60 years after the resurrection, he wrote this. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks, he was the Messiah, and when upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had con condemned him to a cross. Those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them, spending a third day restored to life, for the prophets of God have foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him. And the tribe of the Christians so called after him has still to this day not disappointed. End of quote. Josephus, an unbeliever, a historian, recording those words. And probably some powerful evidence is experiential evidence. The disciples died horrific, horrific deaths for the name of Christ. The fact that over two billion people on the planet now claim to follow Christ. And probably the most important is that the people in this room who know Jesus as Savior can testify of how Christ has transformed their lives. That's something that can't be disputed, the experience that you have. But then we'll look at one passage of biblical evidence. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preaching his first sermon, speaking to the Jewish people gathered there in Jerusalem. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Death could not keep him in the grave. So what is our application here? Receive and live in the reality of the gospel now into eternity. Live in confidence. Live in joy. Live with a purpose-filled life that God wants to use you to do his kingdom work, to share the news of the resurrection of Christ, to share the gospel that when he rose from the dead, created that gospel that would be transformative in people's lives. Receive and live in the reality of the gospel now into eternity. So what is our key thought? What will you do with the reality of the resurrection of Christ? You and I have some very important decisions to make at this Resurrection Sunday time. To accept that the resurrection is true, you must accept God's message of how to be saved, to be born again, to receive the free gift of eternal life or face eternity separated for God, from God forever. And to live for Christ and how he meant for us to live in this life or to live for ourselves independent of God. The Bible teaches that each and every one of us were born into this world, as I read earlier, we we're born into this world in sin. We have the capacity to be independent we have a free will that chooses to do our own thing, contrary to God's commands. And when Adam ate of that fruit, that sin passed down to every human being. That's the bad news. And that separates us from God. But the good news is, as we think of the cross, and we think about Jesus being willing to be our substitute, he was willing to take the wrath of God. He was willing to shed his blood for the payment of our sin. And when he said, it is finished, he died 
And that word, it is finished in the Greek, means to be paid in full. The debt was paid in full. Your sin, my sin, was taken care of once and for all. And the good news is, is that Jesus was buried and rose again. And when he rose out of that grave, he had the power over sin, over death, and to give us the power to have eternal life and to have our lives transformed. So maybe you're here today, maybe you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This is the best day you could ever do that. It could be the start of a new relationship with the Creator to know why God made you and to give you a purpose-filled life. Let's bow our heads and hearts for just a moment. And if you're here today and maybe you've never received Christ as Savior, we talked about the resurrection. God can transform your addictions, your habits of sin, and resurrect you into being a new creation in Christ. But it begins by praying a prayer. It begins by turning your life over to him. And it's not the words of the prayer, it's the intent of your heart. And you need to just say, dear Lord Jesus, I realize that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I've done things against your word. But I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I thank you that Jesus died on the cross on my behalf. And I ask him to come into my heart, to turn away from my sin, and to allow him to be my personal savior. With every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe God is prompting you and you say this morning, no one looking around, I prayed that prayer today. I wanted to make sure that I know that I know that I know that I have eternal life, that I have a relationship with God the Father. If you prayed that prayer this morning, just slip your hand up. No one's looking around. I just want to pray for you. I want to encourage you today. Anyone at all. It's the greatest decision you could ever make in this life. Father, we thank you so much for the gospel. We thank you for Paul laying it out so clearly here in 1 Corinthians 15. We thank you the power that comes from it. Lord, I thank you for how you've changed my life. How in many areas of my life, Lord, you've dug the roots of sin out. And you've put new habits because of your resurrection power in my life. And I'm sure many in this room could, could also attest to that as well. How you've dug deep and taken out the roots of sin and transformed them. Lord, I pray for anyone that hasn't received you, that today they would make sure that they have the assurance of eternal life by turning their life over to you. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And one last thing on your way out, if you'd like to, there's a little pamphlet called Your Spiritual Journey. It'll tell you more about how you can be sure that you have eternal life. They're out there on the information table, and we encourage you to pick one up as you leave today.